We begin with the wildfire raging in Butte County. Tonight, acting governor Gavin Newsom has requested a presidential emergency declaration for direct federal assistance. It comes as the massive campfire has exploded to 20,000 acres since it broke out this morning. Officials describing a scene of mass devastation. Thousands of structures are destroyed. Video shows an entire school on fire with half the sign burned away and several homes up in flames. The 2018 campfire was the deadliest wildfire in modern U.S. history, taking the lives of 86 people in Paradise and Butte County, California. Pacific gas and electric transmission lines were found to be the cause of the fire that destroyed more than 19,000 homes, businesses, and other structures. For years, PG&E knew that dozens of its aging power lines posed a wildfire threat yet failed to replace or repair them. Hey, uh, uh, PG, uh -huh. Rock Creek Powerhouse. Yep. Hey, I just got a report of a fire okay. above Podam on Highway 70. Podam? Yeah, on the railroad side, okay. under the transmission line. I'd like to report a wildfire. Okay, well, it's a beach in uh, uh, Highway 70 above uh, Podam. Uh, yeah, yeah we, we, we've got another report. Okay. And this one, you get heads up to wind the wind. This is Curry Cobb Cow. There looks like a fire coming over the hill. I'm sorry, there isn't an emergency. I, I can't find the number just to call the fire department. Uh, what can I help you with, ma'am? Well, there seems to be, I don't know if there's a fire up here in Magalia. There's a large fire in the Con Cow area. It is not currently threatening Magalia. I don't know where the fire is. Ma'am, there's uh, engines in route. I don't know exactly where it's at right now. I lived in paradise 45 years. The morning of the fire, I wake up early, so I got out about seven o'clock and walked out the front door and the whole sky was bright orange. And so we went up South Libby, took us one hour to get up to the, to the uh, firehouse. Right across the street, a person was pulling a trailer. It was on fire, the trailer was on fire. They stopped right there and it set the trees on fire up above. We sat there, and watch the fires going around us and everything. We were car to car, we could not move. So about that time, the traffic started to move on and several people were going, turning around and then going on. There was a roaring fire across the road. You couldn't see through it and I didn't know what was on the other side of it or anything. But four cars then pulled off to the side to, because they didn't want to go through. And that gave me four car lengths to go ahead and hit it. So I hit the accelerator and just prayed to God that on the other side there wasn't anybody there to stop because I couldn't see. I went through the fire. It did not catch anything of fire except it burned a little bit of paint off the tongue of my fifth wheel. And we got out and when we got down there, there wasn't anybody in the road. It was clear completely, and we went right on down to 99. We didn't have a lot of time. Uh, I remember getting the call, uh, calling back 911. They said evacuate Paradise, so we uh, went around and warned our neighbors, and uh, we packed what we could. Most important thing was our animals, and we were in two separate vehicles. Andy took his truck and the dogs, and I took the cat in my car. Three of our neighbors and ourselves left at the same time. And by the time we got to Pence and Pearson, it was so black you couldn't even see the road, so actually missed the road. The buildings were skeletal, they were on fire. Got turned around and we got separated. There was an emergency vehicle behind me. Eventually got out, knocked on his window and just said, you know, what do you want to do? Because if we sit here, we're going to burn. He helped me turn around again going back towards Pearson. At that point, we lost contact with each other. He didn't see me pass. I didn't see him sitting there. I think my fondest memory is my neighborhood. I know it sounds weird, but the memory of what was there and the memory of the people that were there. My fondest memory after the fire, I think is when the debris cleanup was done. Because I felt like that really marked a turning point uh, where the discussions went from cleanup to rebuild. Uh, when the fire started, um, I was at home getting my kids ready for school. Uh, my wife and I had a routine where she'd get the kids ready in the morning and I'd take them to school. They went to school uh, over here to Chief Charter School. Um, so left that day about uh, 7.45 to take them to school. When I left my house, I live on the, the west side of town over on Castle Drive. 
I could see smoke out in the distance. Uh, however, we're accustomed to seeing smoke in paradise from all the fires that were happening, so it wasn't that alarming up until I started taking the kids to school and I really saw that there was quite a bit of smoke. So after I dropped my kids off at school, I immediately head over to town hall to find out what was going on. Uh, when I got to town hall, we were starting to scramble to put the emergency operations center together. This was probably about 8:10 in the morning, and what we were starting to see was a very rapidly progressing fire. Um, and when I arrived at town hall, they were already calling for evacuations for the east side of town. My phone started ringing off the hook, and I tried to take some calls in the hallway. But it was just too chaotic, so I ended up going outside to make calls. And then that's when pieces of ash the size of my fist were starting to fall down, and I knew we were in trouble. Very limited on resources. Advised if you have medical needs, we'll try and get you assistance. Affirmative. I've got one patient with chest pain. Um, however, you can't get in at this time. Um, we've got explosion structures on fire, and then we're taking directions in our view. We're holding a position on Wagstaff, just about a quarter mile from Skyway. We have several structures threatened and involved. It will close off our Wagstaff route. We have another engine with you. Also, unable to make contact with Branch 2. Uh, affirmative. Uh, you say you can find an LZ. Uh, currently, we're working uh, three burn patients out with uh, burns to uh, approximately 50% of their body. They could uh, land somewhere and uh, tie in with the medics for uh, ground transporting out now. I'll call Calbro to die with them. Hey, guess what? We're not going to catch on fire, okay? We're going to stay away from it. And we'll be just fine, okay? We're doing all right. Uh, we're gonna get out, okay? We're gonna leave. After the fire, you know, we had a large search and rescue effort here in town. I think what was fueling that is at one time, the number of people that was missing was into the thousands. But in order to kind of get that, to give people closure and find people, it required a massive search and rescue. And we had hundreds of people here searching. And I think what it made it really difficult is you were trying to look through literally piles of ash. It was depressing. You know, I was up here right after the fire and you'd, you'd drive around and you'd see the cadaver dogs and you saw unfortunately body bags. And I mean, it was heartbreaking. You didn't know who was gonna be found next. But at the same time, if someone had passed, I wanted their loved ones to know that they found them and not just wonder forever. pg and power lines is what caused the fire. So obviously I'm very upset about that and very upset that the lack of maintenance led to that. On the flip side of that, with the town being nearly wiped out, there was hundreds and hundreds of pg and crews here, literally the day after the fire, putting the electrical infrastructure back in. Um, I don't think the judge's decision takes uh, enough into account of the loss of life. But to be quite honest, I don't know what would. I mean, what's the value of a life? Is it a million? Is it five million? Is it 10 million? I don't know. And I'm not about to put a, a dollar amount on someone's life. You know, unfortunately, I think these fines kind of become the cost of doing business. Um, especially in California, you're seeing this not really a regional problem. I mean, it's happening in Northern California, it's happening in Southern California, it's happening everywhere. So I think it's hard for them to kind of blow it off. But if we don't do anything about it, they're gonna get worse. What is happening in California today will become increasingly common around the world if we do not aggressively combat climate change and transform our power utility.